You wouldn't think that just a few lines of code in Java could be so controversial, but a lot of people in the coding business have some really strong feelings about singletons. Here, let's just go over the basic concept of a singleton class. You can see that we have this static variable that's going to hold our singleton. And one unusual feature of the singleton is that the constructor has been turned off to public access by using the private keyword. Then the singleton has a getInstance method, which is also static. And what that method does is checks to see if the singleton class has ever been called before with its getInstance method. And if it has, it returns the existing instance. But if this is the first time it's being called, it will create a brand new copy of the instance and save it in the instance variable and then return it. This structure forces the class to only ever create one of itself. Why would anyone ever want to do this? Well, before we talk about that, I should first mention this really solid video that talks a little bit about the philosophical objections that a lot of people have to singletons. It was done by a guy named Christopher Okravi, who in his channel is going through a bunch of design patterns from a famous book called Head First Design Patterns. I've put the YouTube link here on this slide, but I'm also going to link it in the video in the description down below in case you want to click on it. If you want to get a better understanding of the philosophical disadvantages of singletons, I strongly recommend you watch this video. I'm not going to talk in this video about whether singletons are good or bad. Uh, that's already been covered by this video I'm, sho I'm showing a link to here. Instead, I want to just focus a little bit on why people use singletons and what problem it is that they're trying to solve, especially in Java where code is always contained in methods and classes. Consider a Java environment like this one where we have a bunch of objects that are sitting around and Let's say further that these yellow objects have other objects inside them, in this case these orange objects. And furthermore, going one step further, let's say that some of these orange objects also have objects inside them, shown here in red. Further assume that all of these objects want access to some facility. The example that's typically given for singletons is a message logger, and that's the example we're going to use in this video. That message logger facility is shown in green here. And what's happening is that the objects presented on this screen want to talk to the message logger and send them strings that, they need, that the message logger needs to record permanently in its database. Now I want to be clear, it's not just the yellow objects that want access to the logger all the objects, including the orange ones and the red ones, they all want access to the logger. And then the question becomes, how can all of these objects get the address of the logger? For our discussion, I'm going to go ahead and label the classes here. I'm going to label the yellow objects to be of class A, the orange ones to be of class B, and the red ones to be of class C. The logger, we'll just call it the message logger class. Now, one way we could try to get all the objects access to the logger is we could build, or if it already exists, take advantage of some all-encompassing class. I've shown that here in this blue color with the class label D. And if that's the case, if we had some sort of all-encompassing object that contained all these other objects, then what we could do is we could, in the constructor for class D, we could create our message logger. And then we would need to pass a handle of the message logger to any objects that we contained. In this case, you can see that the blue objects directly contain the yellow objects of class A. And here, when we create the class A objects, we could pass the logger as an argument to the constructor for all the A objects. And likewise, inside the A class constructor, we could take the logger 
handle that's been given to us and not only save it but also pass it along to any objects that we contain for example here you can see that the loggers handle is being passed on to the B objects now the question arises is this a good way to do things well some might argue that this is kind of complicated and there might be some other simpler alternative that allows all these objects to get access to this green colored logger and here is where people sometimes turn to the singleton and what's going to happen here is we're going to replace the traditional class encoding of the logger and replace it with a, a singleton implementation and what happens in that case is that all the objects that you see here, the yellow ones, the orange ones, and the red ones, can get access to the logger by going through the class. Here you can see uh, the D object is getting access to the logger by calling the getInstance method of the message logger class. Notice that it does not have to pass this information to its children, the constructors of the A classes no longer need this information. Likewise, in the A class, the objects can get access to the logger simply by asking the message logger class for access to it right here. And you can see that the information does not need to be passed to the B class, and the B class does not need to pass it to the C class. So in this sense, it greatly simplifies the access problem of getting access to this object. Now, the real problem here, which I have not discussed, is that the logger object is a global object, and that in itself is a philosophical issue for some folks. And so, once again, I'm not going to discuss that here, but I wanted you to see why people use singletons. It's for this simplification now. You see, we no longer have to chain all the constructors by passing the handle to the logger we can simply use the class to get access